Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 343 of your Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Orthodox, an interview with Barry Mitzman. My name is Richard Johannesson, and I co-hosted this episode with our good friend, Nicoletta Forbes. Folks, Barry Mitzman is a really cool lady who is a social media strategist. She's a podcaster, and she's also a special education teacher. And she had a lengthy Lyme disease journey, which she ultimately came to overcome the, at least the chronic phase of her disease because of the social and spiritual protections that were put in place for her as an Orthodox Jew. Folks, this is a really cool episode and it will help you to learn more about the spiritual and the social elements of Lyme disease, not just the physical or physiological elements of Lyme disease. And I think if we learn anything from this wonderful young woman, that is that we have to make sure that we're treating ourselves socially, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. So folks, without further ado, I'm really happy to introduce to you Orthodox with Barry Mitzman. Hey, Barry Mitzman, and welcome to the Tick Bootcamp podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really pumped to be here. Well, we're really pumped to have you, Barry. And, uh, you know, there are so many different reasons why we wanted you on this podcast. I mean, you are somebody who is becoming more and more well known in the community. And, uh, and, and in part, I'm excited to have you because I want to learn from you because you have an awesome podcast. So why don't you first share with us a little bit about your podcast, what inspired you to become a podcaster? I, at some point, I think I was newly pregnant with my son who, you know, just, you know, turned four and yes, happy I was, birthday to Mel, by the way. Thank you. So I was leaving the job because I wasn't capable of uh, meeting the requirements anymore. And my energy was low and we'll get into it, but you know, unbeknownst to me, my, my line was still active. Um, and as I was leaving the job, somebody said to me and said, you know, why don't you start a podcast? I'm like, what is a podcast? So once it was explained to me, um, I decided to take uh, sort of what I was doing on Instagram and move it onto a different platform. Um, it's called the Woman of Valor podcast. And in it, I share um, some of my own experiences for the sake of you know, educating or validating others' experiences. And if there's a topic that I don't personally know myself, I like to invite um, strong women to come on and discuss, you know, their life experiences that, you know, might not be the norm to discuss openly uh, for the sake of destigmatizing and removing taboo from things that really should be discussed. So as a dad of four daughters, I want to thank you for the great work you're doing in that community. I've listened to a couple of your episodes and it's really well done. So uh, thank you for that great work. And thank you for joining us um, today on the Tick Bootcamp podcast so you can share, um, you know, how this journey, how your life's journey has been affected by Lyme disease. Before we get there, talk to us a little bit about young Barry and where she grew up, because uh, I, I, I can tell from your accent that you are a New Yorker. So uh, talk to us about your experience in New York uh, and, and how that ultimately led you to living in Nevada. Well, actually, I learned very early on that it's Nevada. And if you say Nevada, all the local Nevadans are going to give you the stink eye. <laughs> um, but I did grow up in Brooklyn. Um, my accent is much stronger when I'm there. Um, I'll come back after a trip and then I'm starting to talk like this a lot. And everyone's like, how long were you in New York? And I was like, long enough. <laughs> but um, I grew up born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. I belonged to an Orthodox Jewish community. I was an incredibly ridiculous overachiever. So say in high school, I was president of the, uh, the you know, statewide uh, Jewish youth organization, as well as the president of my high school, as well as the captain of the debate team and involved in the basketball team and, you know, volunteering for different organizations because I could. Um, very loud, rambunctious, big performer. Um, I loved to be involved in all different types of productions, whether it was choir or theater or anything like that. Um, and then on into, you know, college, I, I took a year abroad. I went to Israel for a year and, you know, tried to gain some of my own independence, you know, being a 17 year old, you know, going to a foreign country was, you know, pretty fun. And then, you know, went for my psych degree with, you know, big ideas of going for my PsyD 
And then as I went through my undergraduate, I'm like, maybe I shouldn't do that. And I think that was my subconscious telling me, girl, you have enough to deal with yourself. Don't try healing other people because you got your own stuff to deal with. So then I ended up just going into uh, the education field. I was pursuing my master's in education while working in a special education school and volunteering for three nonprofit organizations while also trying to find a life partner. Um, it's very common in the Orthodox community for you know young women in their early 20s to start looking for a suitable mate, um, which I was doing uh, serially. You know, there I was hustling, um, but I how'd definitely that work out for you? myself Barry, real how'd... busy. So how'd that work out for you while you were going through the serial dating process in the Orthodox community? Honestly, I had a lot of fun. It was great. I mean, I got to meet all different types of people from all different types of backgrounds. I didn't have to pay for dates. There was one that I that I specifically wanted to. Um, and I, I probably had the most fun on that one. I actually saw him recently and I was like, bro, remember that time? And I was so fun. Um, but then, you know, four <laughs> years later, I found my my husband who uh, I felt like maybe I knew that something was about to hit the fan and I needed someone strong. So, so he made it past all the tests and all of my, you know, passion. I was very strong-minded. I still am. Um, but there were quite a few uh, young men that were rather intimidated by my accomplishments, my personality. And uh, he was just like, yeah, I'm cool with it. And I was like, all right, let's put a ring on it. So he did. And that was great. Um, but I, I was living it up, you know, teaching, working you know, grad school was so much fun. I was having a party. Um, and then, you know, everything changed, of course. All right. So it sounds to me that this overachieving, overcommitted uh, gal who's having the time of her life dating, you know, serially for four years, uh, finally does, you know, find someone, uh, find someone who, um, can you know feel good about himself despite being with this hard charging um overachiever uh but you started now to not feel well right so talk yes. to us about when your symptoms started to develop and how this was impacting the hard charging life that you've just described to us so very quickly um like soon after i got engaged i started dropping weight and you know obviously as a you know, young female who's dropping weight, the reaction is, what's your secret? You look amazing. Tell me what you're doing. Are you on so-and-so diet? And I'm like, bro, I am eating chicken fingers and pizza and just like the oiliest non-dietary friendly foods that you can think of. I honestly don't know what's happening. But Barry, so, it was all uh, kosher, right? You, it was all kosher. Yes. Um, you know, yes. Kosher. And the pizza and the chicken were eaten separately at separate occasions. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I have, you know, um, been affiliated with the Orthodox community my whole life, though over the process, I have gone more towards, you know, the right um, in terms of my own observance, you know, finding my own relationship uh, with God and more meaning in some of the, you know, commandments that exist. Um, so I was, I was, you know, eating lots of foods. I had to stop going to the gym. I, I, to add to all of those accomplishments, I was going to the gym four times a week and I started slowing down. Yeah. So, so, so by the way, did you ever sleep? I mean, was it, did you, did you, did oh, you I needed to sleep. I was needed that? to sleep. I was one of those people who always needed at least eight hours. And like, I don't get those people who are like, yeah, like I sleep like four hours and like, and you're a person. Also, I don't drink coffee. So that's also a fun fact. It gives me the shakes and the palpitations. So everyone just assumes that either I don't sleep or I run on coffee. I probably just run on adrenaline and anxiety. That's gen that's like my discovery. Um and a lot of, you know, people pleasing, which we've we've worked on. Thank God. Um, but I I slowly started disappearing and people are saying, Oh, you're probably just nervous because you're getting married. I'm like, no, uh, the dude's amazing. Like I, I want to get married. I don't know what's up. And then I started getting a little weaker and a little weaker and, you know, counting down towards the wedding. I started mentioning to my then fiance, 
you know, maybe we should like completely set up our apartment so that after the wedding, we can just like go to our apartment. No need to do anything fancy. You know, let's just, let's just like go home. Why don't we just go home? And then the wedding came around and I remember I had this updo situation because my hair wasn't so long and I had all these pins in my hair and I was wearing this tight dress and I tried to like lay down on a row of chairs until the photographer needed me. And my friend who like acted as my, you know, dresser was like, oh, you're probably just nervous. I'm like, no, like I'm exhausted. And I was just like, this is going to be terrible. And, you know, we had uh, the wedding ceremony and, you know, you know, in, in our community, the way it kind of goes is like, you have the wedding ceremony and then you're alone for like, I don't know, roughly 20 minutes to spend some time together, eat some food. Then you take a million pictures with, you know, all of your people who've known you in some way, shape or another, you know, in your entire lifetime leading up to this. And then you go out, do some dancing. Um, the men dance on one side, the women dance on the other side, then you get to eat a little bit and then you go and dance again. So, like I said, one of the things I, I really enjoy is performing. And I had to perform at this point out of necessity. So I was a life of the party. I'm dancing. I'm, you know, using all my attitude, all my energy, you know, screaming, you know, because I also was excited. But then I remember when it was time to go for round two of dancing, there were women pulling me like onto the dance floor. And I turned to my like fresh new husband and I was like, please don't make me go. Please don't make me do this. And he was just like, what? And by the time the wedding was over, we waved bye to everyone. I was smiling. We got in the limo and I just keeled over to the side and said, I, I want to go home. And I feel terrible for him for that experience. Um, but I just knew something was wrong and I, I didn't know what. So Barry, let's 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 sort of lead up to this, you know, this this wedding and how things were were changing for you and your health. I, I, I want you to talk a little bit about the symptoms that were developing. And for those folks in our community who have not been to an Orthodox Jewish wedding, um, you know, it it is an unbelievably rigorous experience. Having having gone to law school with several of my friends who were from the Orthodox community, we were you know, we were blessed to my wife and I were blessed to attend several uh, weddings uh, from folks in the Orthodox community, and it is a rigorous experience. It is a it is a wildly rigorous experience. And I know you were leading up to this, and it was a really exciting point in your life. And you're like crashing for something that you had been waiting for for a long, long time. So talk about, you know, first of all, how your symptoms were developing and how this was impacting you emotionally because you weren't able to have the same type of experience you were hoping to have uh, at this uh, at this wedding. So believe it or not, I didn't care that much about the actual wedding. I kind of just wanted to be married, move into a new place with a man and like move on with my life have some babies, you know, and just, you know, live the life. And something that I do want to say is um, if you're thinking, you know, she must be living the life of, you know, the movie Unorthodox or, you know, my unorthodox life, most of the questions that you'll ask to me, the answer is no. So, so just if you're thinking, oh, she probably does this, she probably does this. No, I'm pretty with it. I also grew up you know, much more open-minded. I grew up, you know, watching TV, going to, you know, co-ed camps, you know, I, and, and a lot of what I chose, I chose, I chose to be in the place that I am. Um, but at first I just, I kind of just assumed that I was just getting busier. And because of all of the stuff going on, I was just dropping things like, like going to the gym. And one of my, one of my, uh, classes in grad school was um, about applied behavioral analysis, which is a, a method in helping um, individuals, um, more specifically individuals on the autism spectrum, but this does work with many other, um, with many other individuals. Um, we had to create an ABA plan for ourselves. And most, most of the people in my class were like, well, if I, you know, 
do my work or if I do whatever, I'll get myself a coffee. And I was like, hi, overachieving self. I'm not just going to like pass all my classes in grad school. I'm going to ace them. So I did, you know, I'm going to go to the gym and for every half an hour that I'm at the gym this week, I get 15 hours of FaceTime calling my fiance, um, you know, Friday afternoon before the Sabbath. And if I don't get to go at all, then I don't get to speak to him at all. And I pushed myself. And as I was doing that, I realized like, wow, this is so hard. I mean, obviously I earned myself an hour of FaceTime with my fiance. Cause like girl needed to see her boo. Um, but I was just like, why is this so much more difficult now? And I was just so confused because I, um, I already knew, you know, for years prior that I had PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. So one of the things um, one of the characteristics for myself was that I retained and maintained the same weight consistently from the age of 16. And regardless of any um, health changes that I made or um, or anything like that, I maintained the same weight. And then suddenly I just started disappearing. Um, and honestly, unfortunately, I wasn't so bothered by that. I was curious, but I wasn't so bothered. But at the point where people were concerned that I wasn't eating. Um, that's the part that got me starting to get hot and bothered about it. Um, and, you know, later on in my, you know, Lyme journey, I actually started getting frustrated by the amount of attention um, my outward appearance got, you know, and how that kind of overtook, you know, any care and concern about my actual physical well being. But slowly, I just, I started just getting more tired and, I was so focused on getting to the finish line of getting married that it didn't concern me as much. But once I got into that limo and the doors closed and I just keeled over, I was like, what is happening? And then I, you know, I went to, we traveled a bit after we got married. We kept on like canceling our honeymoon. I had some semblance of an excuse every time. And I remember we actually did go to Denver a few weeks after we got married. And suddenly I just started like shivering out of nowhere. My body was shaking. I was getting weak. And my poor, you know, newly minted husband was just like, what is going on? And then we move into, you know, the high holy days for, you know, Jewish people, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, I was actually sitting in a rabbi's house who was leading, you know, services. And I'm sitting there like eating small bits of food. It was directed to me that, you know, every few minutes I should take small bites of food. And I remember uh, my, my young brother-in-law came in and saw me taking small bites of food and goes, oh, you're pregnant. I'm like, dude, we've been married for five minutes. There are there are precautions in place to prevent that from currently happening. Um, but like, shut up. So then I was telling people that I was feeling tired. I was feeling weak. We moved to Muncie, New York. I was teaching in a self-contained classroom um, in a mainstream school. And I was just, everything was just exhausting. And of course, the hypotheses, maybe you're pregnant, maybe you're anemic, you know, maybe you're just nervous, it's nerves, you know, you just got married, it's a new life, it's just nerves. And I was just like, can everybody just leave me alone? And it got to a point where it was recommended that I actually just go get blood tested. Because they're like, you know what, you might as well just figure out what in the world is going on. So you're 22 years old at this time you're you're roughly young, young yeah. teaching you're around 22 so the so the symptoms are sort of that are developing is is weight loss and fit, i guess it's increasing fatigue you're getting more and more tired you're getting tired easier and easier and uh and it, and it is to the point where between the observations that people are making about your appearance and and the impact that your fatigue is having on your capacity to be Barry, uh, you decide you're going to go to a doctor. So what, why did you go to the doctor? Meaning what, what symptoms did you describe to the doctor? And what did the first doctor say to you 
when you went to get your blood test? So I went to some random doctor in Rockland County um, and said, you know, I'm, I also like my, my appetite started to diminish um, as well. Like before I was eating food and dropping weight. And then at this point, I just, my passion and rather preoccupation with food was kind of uh, dwindling and as was my appetite. So I went in, I'm saying, you know, I'm not, you know, feeling as hungry as I was. I seem to be losing a lot of weight. I'm, I'm really tired. I'm, I'm achy and I just don't know what's going on. And the doctor told me, okay, so I'm going to test for, you know, I'm going to take a pregnancy test or I'm, I'm going to do um, just like a regular CBC. Like, and then we're going to do, you know, I'll test you for anemia, you know, in that, you know, checking your iron levels and stuff. There's, and I'm going to check for Lyme. I'm like, isn't that a fruit? What do you check? Like, I, I've ne I, I had never heard of Lyme disease before, but. Okay, let's pause that. Yeah. Let's pause that for a second. That's important. So, so you, you're a kid from Brooklyn. So it doesn't surprise me that you probably weren't all that outdoorsy during your time as a city dweller. And for folks who are uh, from outside of New York, Brooklyn is a part of New York City. And 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 there isn't a whole lot of open space in Brooklyn, although there is there is there are some parks uh, in Brooklyn. But you were going to summer camp. So where were you camping during the summers during your childhood? So I was in uh, Pennsylvania, it's, uh, currently named Lakewood, Pennsylvania, and it we did have overnights outdoors. Um, it was one of my favorite things about camp is going on the overnights. You get to like make you know. What are they called? Eggs in a cradle when you have like the the egg and the toast. And honestly, peeing outside was like such a vibe. It was not some, not something that I was used to. And now that I have a son, I'm like, you get to do this all the time, man. We pull over on the side of the road. Us, we gotta find a gas station, you know, like tragic. But I do remember at one point I saw this, I don't believe it was a tick. But I do remember we were hiking because we hiked from camp to the campground. And I saw this just like black. It just looked like a black oval on, on my hand. And I was like, what the hell is that? And I just like, you know, flicked it off. And I was like, that's gross. And I remember they like specifically told us to wear long pants. Uh, they didn't tell us why, or I don't remember them telling us why, but they said, you know, wear long pants while we're, you know, going through. Uh, to the campsite. And so we always did that. But I just remember, like, I always remember that moment where I'm just like, what is that? I just like flicked it off. So knowing what I know about Lyme now, like that was not my experience um, with contracting Lyme disease. Right. So but Barry, you're, you're a young woman. And, and at the time that you would have been camping, uh, you know, the camp community should have been aware of Lyme disease. We've had many, many people on this podcast go to summer camp, not receive any information about ticks or Lyme disease, and then come back sick from sick from Lyme disease, or at some point in the future where they where they find themselves in a high stress environment uh, that they're immunocompromised and they ultimately they ultimately begin to become uh, you know ill as a result of contact with uh, with um, a, a tick during a camping experience. So just so that uh, I understand. So young Barry's a, a, a summer camper and not only is she, you know, in a you know rural community in Pennsylvania, which by the way, has the highest Lyme disease rate in the country, Pennsylvania does. You were given zero instruction about checking for ticks. You were given zero instruction about how to protect yourself from ticks. And you were given zero instruction um, about how to check yourself on a daily basis to find out whether or not you had any ticks biting you during this camping experience in Pennsylvania. Yeah, no, not at all. We, and then when we were on the campgrounds, the campgrounds had, you know, low grass. There weren't like any, any wild greenery situations going on. And quite frankly, I don't think that the camp had much experience with Lyme disease um, or, or, really realized, but I'm assuming at this point, you know, I started going to camp at like 10 years old, you know, so I'm assuming at this point, you know, 20 years later, there's been enough um, information distributed for 
you know, that camp and other camps to be aware of it. You know, at this point, there are organizations within the Jewish community that do help support individuals and, and provide referrals, you know, for people who are, you know, battling Lyme. Well, I, I, I hope you're right, because it actually hasn't been our experience that uh, that uh, any of the camps or any of the people that we've interviewed who have gone to camps have given any Lyme awareness uh, information. So I, I, hope in the, I hope in the Jewish community they are doing that. But quite frankly, Barry, I'd be surprised if they are because it's just not consistent with what we're learning. And that's part of the reason why we do what we do because we're trying to get that information out to the, you know, to the entire community and certainly in particular the, the, the folks who are running camps. Uh, there really does have to be you know, Lyme education as a part of the camping experience. And there has to be a regular, um, a, a regular program in place, not only for the, for the medical staff at the camp, but also for all of the camp counselors to assist the campers in making sure that they're not getting sick from Lyme disease. So uh, I, I hope, I hope that is happening at least in, 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 in some communities. So let's, uh, let's now fast forward to, uh, to uh, your doctor's appointment, because I paused to to go back and and find out whether or not you knew anything about Lyme disease from your camping experience, because he said when you when your doctor said uh, that you should be tested for Lyme disease, you thought it was a fruit. So talk to us about what the doctor said when your reaction was, "Hey, why are you testing me for a fruit?" I'm pretty sure she just ignored that. Sometimes I say things, and if people don't get my it's not humor. Sometimes I just talk and it, and it ends up being funny. Um, but she was just like, all right, now just roll up your sleeve and, you know, let's take some blood. And. But wait a minute, was, Barry. I mean, you know, you're, you're trying to be funny or you're anxious and you're saying something that's kind of funny or you're. you're no, but I genuinely thought it was a fruit. Yeah. So, 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 so the doctor didn't say, well, you know, you're, you're, nope. you're living in a tick endemic community and Lyme is a disease that that you, you may have contracted at some point in your life. And we want to test you for that because you're starting to show some symptoms that lead you to believe that perhaps this is this is a disease that you may be suffering. There was no conversation like that. No. Well, it also could be my memory has been super fuzzy since since, you know, um, the whole Lyme situation. Um, I just like to call it a situation because sometimes it's really painful to think about. But we will get into that here. Um, I probably just turned to my to my new husband and said, you know, why is she testing me for a fruit? Um, and he wasn't so aware of it either because he, he too grew up in Brooklyn, but we met, um, you know, at, uh, at a large uh, Sabbath meal with 120 people at his rabbi's house. So he ended up just moving there when he was much older. So I didn't, he didn't grow up with the, you know, check for ticks um, thing like many people in, you know, Rockland County uh, did. All right, so now, so your doctor says she's going to check you for Lyme. She takes some blood, and what happens? We wait. <laughs> we wait and we wait. And I was, you know, hypothesizing what it could possibly be. And we were still in the middle of the, you know, September through October is a very holiday packed uh, time for, you know, Jews. So like right after the holidays were over, you know, I was just, you know, we went to my parents a little bit Then we went back to our apartment and invited friends over. And I was trying not to think about it. So I was like, I'm glad I have some semblance of a distraction. And then, you know, the day after, you know, that long marathon of holidays was over, um, we got the call of my blood results and they said that I had Lyme disease and I just started laughing because I'm like, obviously the one thing that I haven't heard of and have no idea what it is, is the one thing that I have. And, you know, as the protocol told them, they sent in a script for uh, 30 days of doxy doxycycline, um, which I accidentally started taking on an empty stomach, which was not the best idea take some crackers. I had to like force feed myself saltines as I took it. And, you know, I was still working. Thankfully it was just a half a day in this school and it was just really hard uh, to get there. And then as I was taking the doxycycline, I started feeling more pain, started getting like a burning 
pain in the back of my neck. And I'm, I was just like, I thought this was supposed to cure me and it's making me feel worse. What the hell? So that's when I started, you know, opening up about it to, um, a couple of friends of my husband's. I didn't have a lot of friends, uh, in Muncie. Most of my friends were still in Brooklyn and they mentioned, you know, you know, after the 30 days, you know, my, my husband's friend's wife worked in this, um, Lyme specialist's office. Uh, and by Lyme specialist, I mean, that he was a regular PhD doctor, you know, who uh, left his regular practice to deep dive into, uh, Lyme disease, the causes, um, tr possible treatments and all of that. And then went to doing that full time. And because we, my husband called around, my husband's a big researcher. He's a web developer. He's a digital marketer. He's, he's into the data. And, you know, we heard other options, like maybe call these specific, uh, neurological specialists in, you know, Manhattan. And he called and he's like, what are you going to do? And essentially the point that they made was, well, if you take doxycycline for 30 days and you still feel sick, then you have a neurological problem. Okay. So let's pause that for one second, uh, because Nicolette is going to take you through it, but I want to go back to your first doctor for a second yeah. and, and talk to a little bit more about that first doctor. So I have to say, I, I have a mixed reaction to that first doctor. So I, I will have to say to you, I really love that the doctor tested you for Lyme disease right away. I can't tell yeah. you how rare that is that a doctor, when you walk in with the type of symptomology that you have, will want to test you for Lyme disease. In fact, most of our people are diagnosed in the supermarket or online by a non medical professional, and then they have to go back and beg for Lyme testing with a doctor. So I really love that the doctor tested you for Lyme so quickly. I also love that the doctor gave you 30 days of doxycycline because in most cases, it's a su substantially shorter uh, uh, dose of, of doxy. And you do need at least 30 days. And in most cases, it's, it's, it, it should be six weeks. But getting, getting beyond the 21-day uh, prescription of, of doxy is fantastic because this is a doctor who understood the life cycle of Lyme and wanted to give you, if you were acutely ill, enough, uh, enough doxy to assist your uh, immune system in battling that microbe. So those are two wonderful things about that doctor, and I applaud her for that. However, however, and let me get to the however piece, right? Um, you know, it seems to me that this doctor wasn't giving you a lot of information, meaning she wasn't partnering with you and getting you prepared for the steps that you had to take if you had acute Lyme disease, no less chronic Lyme disease. And right. uh, so my, my first question to you is, did you, did you just sort of gloss over the information that she gave you? Or did she just say, hey, take this prescription for 30 days and be on your way kind of thing, which is what it kind of sounds like? Or did she talk to you the about the difference between acute and chronic Lyme disease? Did she talk to you about Herxheimer reactions and how, uh, you know, you're going to feel, you know, you're going to feel sickly and that, you know, and that, uh, and that's a part of this process. Did she talk to you about, you know, taking steps to support your immune system when you're going through this element of your journey? I mean, what information did she give you? Was it really nothing or was it, um, you know, or was it a little more than that? So the blessing and the curse of going to this new doctor in, you know, Rockland County was a, you know, Rockland County has a high case volume of tick bites and tick-borne illnesses. So because I moved there, I was able, it, it was just one of those things where like, we're just going to test you. And, and I, I heard that at times there may be individuals who get tested for the standard testing of Lyme and it comes back negative. So I'm also thankful that I was able to get a positive on this specific test. Um, but the con was that it was kind of like one of these places where they kind of farm you out, like let's get the patient in, let's get the patient out type of thing. I 
don't recall any information, any explanations. And I got the call that I tested positive for Lyme on the phone. And there wasn't any, you know, how about you come in make another appointment, like charge my insurance, do whatever you need to do, like make that bread. But like, you're going to, you're not going to bring me in. They were just like, no, we're just going to send a prescription and then, you know, they'll deliver it to you and you just start taking it. And that's it. I didn't really get um, an education. I had never heard of a Herxheimer reaction. I was not prepared. And I do think that my fear of the unknown, you know, made everything so much worse. And I, and I also do have a generalized anxiety disorder. So like not being led through things, not helpful. Just not. So, so let's talk about, let's talk about, you know, um, fight or flight. Let's talk about the impact that fight or flight has on your immune system. And, and, and talk to us about how the lack of um, the ability to receive this information from your doctor exacerbated your anxiety and made it more likely that you would continue to get ill despite receiving uh, some treatment. Well, I mean, I am one of those people that if I know everything I need to know, I'm able to handle things much and handle things much better. I was a very good student. I was a very good note taker. And, you know, as part of, you know, the people pleasing package goes, you listen to instructions and you excel. Um, but I didn't get many instructions. And, you know, also being at that point, you know, being malnourished also messes with your psyche. So my, you know, fright, I guess, was like, so elevated and i i you know i know that through working on myself and learning more about who i am my makeup how my mind works i'm i have a very very strong psychosomatic connection as well so it's very likely that my symptoms were exacerbated because of my emotional distress listen i'm newly married i barely know this dude you know, I knew enough to make an educated decision that this is the man I wanted to marry. Like we also went to ther like couples counseling before we got married. It wasn't like a whole arranged marriage myth that I, that I knew nothing, but still, you know, to, to date someone to, and then to, you know, move in with them is, is, a, is a pretty big change. And then to be living in a, we, we moved to Muncie not into like a, an apartment or like an apartment complex where I could meet, you know, other young newly marrieds. We moved, you know, into a cul-de-sac all the way at the end, you know, in somebody's basement who had, you know, probably seven kids at the time. And we were, we were literally just underground and I was isolated from my friends. Uh, you know, my parents lived in Brooklyn. We didn't see them you know, so often, you know, unless we drove there for the weekend and it, and then working in a new school and, and being like, you know, feeling that responsibility of like, oh my God, these children's educations and lives are in my hands. And it was just all of this, like, what in the world am I doing? What did I get myself into? And why am I feeling so crappy? Just kind of blew up. And the weakness felt like more weakness and the pain felt like more pain. And, you know, I, I've learned to say, you know, between my, my, the birth of my daughter and the birth of my son, you know, the birth of my son was way easier. And I was able to go to the hospital way later because I knew exactly what was going on. And I have a pretty decent pain tolerance, but if I don't know what's going on, that pain tolerance goes out the window. So I was just, all of the pain was wreaking havoc without any information, consolation, and education. So, Nicoletta, before you take uh, Barry on the rest of her treatment journey, are you as anxious as I am hearing that she was living in a basement and we know that generally moldy environments are really, really bad for people who are trying to go on a healing journey and that it almost sounds like Barry probably, if she had gotten proper medical treatment, may not have gotten chronically ill, but did get chronically ill because she was, you know, she was just not 
working with somebody who wanted to partner with her and give her the information that she yeah. needed to be, uh, to be uh, healthy in this. I mean, uh, is, is that screaming out to you, Nick, the same way it is to me? A hundred percent. Like I'm sitting here listening, but at the same time, it's like, I have so many questions, <laughs> so many questions, right? Because like, like you said, Rich, you had a doctor that knew to test for Lyme to begin with, but then I'm sitting here thinking, is it because they do see so much Lyme? It's like, oh, hey, ring, ring, you have Lyme disease. Here's your um, prescription for Doxy. You're good to go. Bye. Next. You know, like, is it that that's what it is? Or, or I, I just, I don't know. I'm baffled because it's like they got it right on the first try but then yet failed so badly right okay, so that's like my first question but i do have a question about the testing did you do the western blot test which test did you do i believe it was the western blot test um but like like you said the, your description of what my experience with that doctor was was exactly that there wasn't any information of you know you might have co-infections you know what was laying dormant in your system may or may not have been activated you there was nothing it was just like you know yeah you either have Lyme or you don't and you either respond to the medicine or you don't and if you don't you have a neurological disorder yeah and the fact that it was picked up on the western blot that in itself is you know because those are inaccurate like 50 percent of the time right so it's exactly. just like there's there's just so much where I'm like, oh my gosh, I have, I have so many questions. Right. But, um, yeah, no, same thing, Rich. It's like, okay, you, it's just, yes. So, okay. So your first treatment was doxy 30 days, right? Yeah. You guys are living here in this basement at this point, after taking the doxy, you're still not feeling great. Right. You said it's making you feel worse. What, did you stay with the same doctor or at that point, did you move to another doctor? What, what does that look like after you're not feeling better and you're in this environment? So it seemed very clear that this doctor was like, I did what I needed to do. You need anything else? I can't help you. Like go call, you know, you know, NYU hospital and speak to infectious disease specialist. And like I said, you know, my husband did the research and he was just yeah. like, why would we go to the city for them and, and pay them to tell us that you have a neurological problem and that they can't help you? Because he called all these places. Like, what are you going to do? Like, I just want to know what it is that you're going to do to see if like this is if this makes sense. And then my husband remembered that a friend of his, um, you know, a friend of his mentioned that his wife worked at this doctor who was, you know, treating patients with Lyme disease, though he, you know, wasn't officially a Lyme specialist, but, you know, like he quit, you know, his regular practice of being a, you know, a general practitioner to do all this research and treat Lyme. So decided to go to him and his bedside manner was uh, subpar and the wait times were astronomical and we paid completely out of pocket, obviously. So when yeah. anyone asks, you know, what we did with our wedding money, it was all given to my Lyme journey, which I felt absolutely terrible about um, and, and still do. I'm like, that was a lot of money. Like, oh my God. And we had to just pay that to like try all these ridiculous things. Um, some of them were ridiculous. Are, some, yeah. So essentially, so that, yeah. Yeah. What are some of those ridiculous things that you did have to try? And so you got diagnosed at 22, you did the doxy and then from 22 to what, at what age did you try some of these their things and what were they okay so basically i started first i had to go take more blood so i went with my husband like he took me to go take blood and i closed my eyes and they took these vials and i was just like i don't want to know when i look at the blood it makes me nauseous and after it was done i turned i, I turned to my husband and i said you know 
how many vials did they take? And he goes, you don't want to know. I'm like, no, I, I want to know. So he took 20 vials of blood. And basically, after taking those 20 vials of blood, they used those just to, you know, test for so many things, so many things. So when we got the results back, obviously we needed to schedule a 90 minute session with this, with this, um, Lyme specialist. And he explained to me what the infections were, um, what they do to my system, you know, what I had, uh, if I had any genetic mutations, which I like, which I did. And, you know, I remember him saying Babesia, Babiosis, you know, also your Epstein bar is active and you have this herpes six. I'm like, I have herpes. And like, I was like panicking. I'm like, <laughs> you did not tell me about your past, sir. And my husband's like, that's, I don't think that's what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> But, and then, and then he put me on, okay, I, I, I have, I still have it downstairs and I still use it sometimes, but I, I bought what I call a bubby box. Bubby is the uh, endearing term that many Jewish and Yiddish, you know, affiliated people call their grandmother. And it was a giant pill box, like giant, um, because I needed to take, he put me on antibiotics, um, antivirals, um, probiotics, supplements, um, an antifungal because he was nervous that I was going to get like a yeast infection, taking some of the antibiotics, um, like, like, um, glutathione that I took orally that tasted like rotten eggs. And I would throw up every time I took it because nobody told me that you're supposed to like you don't have to put it directly on your tongue and hold it. Um, it was disgusting. Um, he had me on an anti-malaria medication that made my pee look like I was dying. And then also made me like violently ill. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just on so many things. I took a leave of absence from work. Um because I just, cause it went from me going into work. Like I was going, you know, three times a week and then like every other day. And they were like, this is not stable for your students. So I took, you know, uh, a couple months absence, uh, from work. And thank God I had a wonderful, very capable teaching assistant who took over and did a wonderful job. She honestly should have just been the teacher the whole year. I just got to say that because I did not give those kids my 100% because I didn't have 100% to give. Um, and every few weeks I would go back to the doctor and he would, you know, ask me on my symptoms where he also had me taking Alka-Seltzer for the Herxing. Hmm. I remember that. Like I said, like my memory is like super foggy since, you know, I don't know when exactly I got Lyme disease. I just remember I started feeling a little sick after I got back from Puerto Rico. Is there any any research to say that there are ticks in Puerto Rico? Oh yeah, there, I mean there there are, there are plenty of ticks all over the Caribbean. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, there, there's 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 a ton of ticks in Puerto Rico. But you know, look, this it, it's oh it's going to be difficult to identify Barry when you had gotten bitten because it's likely you were bitten many many times during the course of your life. And you know, the question that you know I have in my mind is. Did you just get bitten when you moved to Rockland and that sort of activated everything that you had been harboring for a long time? Was it because you were living in this probably moldy environment? Uh, is it because you had so much going on that was just overwhelming and, you know, immunosuppressive? Um, and, you know, part of, you know, what's making me anxious about the story is if, um, you know, if you had been treated properly right after you were diagnosed, you may not have become chronically ill. So that's a part of the story that's really making me cringe that, you know, that, um, you know, if you had the proper treatment, you might not have had uh, the, you know, the, the challenges that you had and, and you know, sort of like the emotions and, you know, and, and, and I think Nicoletta and I would like you to build some of that up first, like your emotional issues seem to be getting worse and worse and worse, right? You're, you're generally an anxious person, you know, have these doctors that are not treating you well, so you're getting more anxious. 
you're not able to serve these students that you are committing your life and your career to. We know that that students that are on the spectrum are going to need a lot of consistency. So you're coming in and you're going out and you're coming in and going out, and that's having an impact on your ability to serve these people that you've dedicated your career towards. So talk to us, us about how that has impacted you emotionally and how that's making it even more difficult for you to heal. So I have always had very high expectations for myself um, and high expectations of how I serve other people. Um, it's uh, it's debatable whether it's something that was innate or something that was conditioned, probably both. But I had this very intense drive to make everyone else happy and make everyone else fulfilled. And it was not something that I was able to do during that time. I do also believe very strongly that because of how anxious I was and because there was so much trauma prior to that, that I wasn't even aware of at that point, but was just sitting within me. I believe that had I worked through that and resolved that prior, I don't think the illness would have hit me as badly as it did. That's, yeah. that's something that, that I believe yeah. because I do know that my psychosomatic connection is incredibly strong. Um, but I, I was, like I said, living in a basement, you know, newly married, not living up to the expectations of a wife that I had for myself, my husband, the angel that he was, um, and is, you know, was very, very patient with me and, very kind and giving and I was getting so distressed because the the medicine even made me more nauseous and less hungry and I only remember having actual meals maybe two three times a week and that was with the help of um which was then contraband but is now normal um marijuana it was the only way to get my um to get me down to a place like anxiety wise and then give me an appetite so that weed was like the only way for me to be like you know what babe run down the street to that place and get me like that meat <laughs> pizza that they have or okay i can probably eat in the next 20 minutes run to that chinese place and get that sesame chicken and i'll eat that you know, and we did need to eat with to watching something so that I wasn't so hyper focused on how much I was eating because it really wasn't a lot. But I needed to just like have something not on my mind about like, why am I not eating enough? Why can't I eat? Like, what happened to me? Like, my appetite, I used to be able to just like eat and eat and eat. And now I can't. And like, oh man, now I'm in so much pain. And, you know, we're stuck in like a very, very, very small apartment like very small. And there were points where I was so weak that I would have to ask my husband to carry me to the bathroom, which was a solid seven or eight feet away from our bedroom. Like I said, it was very tiny. It's like my whole apartment is probably the size of our garage now. And I was like, this is not romantic. This is not what I signed up for. Like, why is it that like the most fun we have is when we're like laying in our room watching Parks and Rec? Like this is pathetic. And like I would spend days on end just in my bed because I was too weak to do anything. And the treatment that this doctor had me on was so incredibly aggressive that it, I felt like even though it was meant to heal me, it kind of felt like it was destroying me at the same time. And later on, I've, I discovered that this, that this practitioner no longer uses antibiotics with his treatment. Um, but this was, you know, seven, eight years ago. And obviously people get different um, education and, and follow different schools of thought and those evolve, which I'm appreciative that he learned. Um, I hope that his bedside manner, you know, improved as well. Um, but I, you know, after 
many, many months of taking all of these pills and gels and God knows what, I started feeling a little bit better. And I was just like, okay, I'm good now. And that's where I kind of left it. And once I was like, okay, I'm good now. I was like, babe, we need to leave Muncie. Like, I don't want to live here anymore. We need to get out of here. We need to relocate. Like, I can't do this anymore. And that's when we decided to, well, no, we decided before that, that we wanted to to run away from everyone and everything. But we couldn't until I finished uh, graduate school. And, you know, we heard about Vegas and we wanted to take a pilot trip that January after we got married, but I actually had an emergency surgery. My small intestine was telescoping in on itself. At first, I'm like, obviously it's related to Lyme. Like, no, it was just a condition that I've had since I'm two or three and it was just neglected. So it was a medical marvel that, you know, a 23 year old needed to had a condition that's in toddlers that they like literally stick a tube up the kid's butt to blow it out so that it's like a flailing inflatable tube man and not like a telescope, but overlooked by me and it telescoped in and out so often it needs to be cut out. We pushed off our trip until, you know, May time. We liked the idea that it was very dry because we were concerned about moisture and humidity um, and mold. And as soon as I took my last um, exam, we left and we moved. Um, and I was pretty sure that, you know, my stint with Lyme was over. I had my, you know, daughter probably a year after we moved, um, to Vegas. And then I had, I started getting a lot of nerve pain. Um, and I was still suffering from fatigue and I realized something might be wrong. And I was concerned because I was also like newly pregnant with my son. So I decided to find a new specialist. Um, and this specialist was a holistic specialist. He was originally a chiropractor who, you know, suddenly some people in his community back in Muncie, ironically, um, were coming to him with, you know, concerns about different illnesses. And he began to research and find, you know, different um, treatments for different things. And I became friends with his daughter actually on social media. That's how it started. His daughter was on social media. She mentioned that her father's a holistic doc, um, you know, specialist who actually worked through muscle testing which was something I never heard of and kind of was just like, okay, that's heebie-jeebie. Um, and he's a quack, cool. But like, why don't I just try it? Cause I don't want to take 20 vials of blood again. Um, and he also did make me take vials of blood. Actually, that's not true. He made me take vials of blood. Um, but he did it through my doctor here because I didn't want to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars out of pocket. So he reached out to my doctor here with a whole bunch of instructions of please get her to do all this blood test before she flies in to see me. And, you know, he put all those through, I did all the tests. And when I finally went to him and he did the blood work in combination with the muscle testing, he told me that I still had multiple infections still active, including my Epstein-Barr, um, including the herpes six and including you know, some, some tick born illnesses. And I began to panic because my son was in utero and I'm like, great. So I tore like, I went through hell and now I'm going to have my son live through hell as well. So he put me on like a no sugar diet. He had me avoiding, you know, wheat. He had me avoiding dairy. He had me on a whole bunch of supplements, you know, um, like a silver supplement that was, different like olive leaf he was I was on a whole bunch of things and I would go back and forth every uh few months and I remember you know going to someone uh, for for my gig on social media I do some modest fashion stuff and I was very interested in this concept of color palettes and I went to go get a color palette done by a color analyst and she 
alluded to the fact that I was still like green, um, not like olive complexion, but like sickly green. And she was like, you know what, when you, when you feel better, you know, maybe you'll mm. come, come back and I'll, I'll, I'll redo this for you at no charge, but like, maybe, maybe you should come back when you're like, when you're better. <laughs> so I was like, and I, I overlooked it. And then later on when I went back, she was like, oh my God, you're not green anymore. This is amazing. I was like, watch, like, honey, you are green. <laughs> I was like, thanks. Um, but yeah, then I switched to him and I feel like I've been talking for a while. So I'm going to pause. You might have questions. I, I do have a question actually. Um, if you guys can hear me. Yeah. When you were pregnant with your son, did at any point, did it become a concern that you may have passed Lyme to him? Yes, it was definitely a concern. Um, and um, this doctor, I'll, I'll call him by name, uh, Dr. Weidenbaum, um, unfortunately of blessed memory, he, he passed within the year, um, which has been tragic for so many people. Um, so he had me doing certain things, um, avoiding certain things, taking certain things um, to do whatever possible to prevent the Lyme from, you know, going into his bloodstream and transferring it over to him. Later, we we got him tested and thank God he does not have Lyme in his system. And oh, neither does my fantastic. daughter. God is amazing. Oh, that's awesome. Um, very, very miraculous. And I'm very, very thankful, but I, you know, I called my rabbi and I'm like, he doesn't want me to have bread. You know, uh, when I wash, you know, on the Sabbath, I'm supposed to have this hall of bread and I can't have it. He's like, do whatever you need to do lady. Like, it, it, like this is your health here. And this is your, your unborn child's health. Like you need to do whatever possible. So that was like, also very nice to see that, like, the leadership and the rabbis that I was speaking to, like understood that, you know, your health really does come first, you know, and that comes to physical health and mental health. And yeah. you know, Judaism has a lot of wiggle room when it comes to that, because someone's life always um, comes before, you know, what, you know, the Torah, you know, commands. That's, that's awesome. Just to have support, you know, that in itself is a support system. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I, uh, there were people, you know, throughout the journey that were supportive and there were people throughout the journey who really weren't. Um, and that was really painful. You know, like I said, the preoccupation with how skinny I was, you know, people were like, you know, Barry, you're already married. You don't have to lose weight anymore. And I was like, dude, I'm really sick. Yeah. And I was like, well, at least you look good. Like, no, not at least I look good. I'm freaking miserable. And then they're just being like, you know, I had a relative come to me and going, you know, this person is cooking you meals and this one's, you know, picking up your groceries for you. It's like, what do I got to do in order to get that? And I was like, are you, are you kidding me right now? And then you had the people who were like, well, thank God, honey, you know, at least you know what it is because I know that my neighbor's third cousin's ex-wife's, you know, previous dog owner had Lyme disease and they didn't know for 10 years. So like, at least, you know, and I'm like, that is the most invalidating thing you could possibly say, you know, and then there yeah. are the people who are like, how can I be here for you? You know, like, what, what do you need of me? Like, and that, you know, for me surviving, it was like, you know what, let me ask the Trader Joe's guy to carry my bags to my car. Let me, you know, my friend asks me if there's anything she can do, I can ask her to pick up the groceries or I can ask her to bring over, you know, some chicken soup, you know, for the Sabbath, for Shabbat, you know, like there were people who were willing to help and it was kind of just like seeing who could. And like my, my rabbi was also really amazing, really supportive. And, you know, with that came also mental health challenges and, and he was also there to, you know, guide me on, you know, in addition to my therapist, I don't just rely on religious figures to, you know, help me <laughs> navigate life. You need to also take initiative and do what you need to do. So that also involved therapy and, um, the support that I got from the people that I knew I could count on was was incredible and, and, and very helpful. And I'm, you know, thankful for that. 
That's no, that's great. So the doctor you had when you were pregnant with your son, was that the last doctor that you saw for yes. Lyme disease? Okay. Yes. And so all in all, how long did your, from diagnosis to that point, what was the time span? From diagnosed, well, I was newly pregnant with my son. My daughter was about maybe a year at that point. So we were married for, so it was roughly around three years and change from the okay. diagnosis until I started seeing Dr. Weidenbaum. So folks, if, if you haven't, if you haven't figured it out by now, you know, we're, we're, we're really blessed to have Nicoletta working with us today. And, and she's so kind that while she's on a cruise ship, she's actually participating uh, in this uh, podcast. So if you're hearing it come in and out and we're not going to edit that out, uh, it's because uh, Nicoletta has been kind enough to join me as a co-host, despite being on a vacation with her family. But I'm going to, I'm going to fill in here because it looks like we're losing uh, Nicoletta. So uh, Barry, why don't you talk to us um, a, a little bit about the overall experience of um, of treating uh, your disease, and then I'd like you to sort of reflect on what went well and what didn't go well during that three and a half year window where you treated to remission. Well, I mean, maybe let let me rephrase a little bit. So I didn't go into remission until my son was two and a half or three years old so there was another three three to four year period where I was you know aware that I was struggling with Lyme and you know until I you know got the clear and that was actually pretty interesting um I will share this so wait, before, before yeah. you go, let, let's pause for a second. So, so you, it was a total of six years. The journey was a total of six mm -hmm. years. Okay. So, so you shared with Nicoletta that you, you uh, had treated with doctors for three years. what did you do for the next three years before you got to remission? So I first, let's say like for that first year after I was like, I was diagnosed and then for like roughly eight months or six months, I was working with this very aggressive treatment and I was kind of just like, screw that. That was insane. And I'm feeling better than I was. So I guess I'm all healed. I didn't bother going back. Um, and then I stayed away for a few years. Um, and then I guess like two years later, when I was two and a half years later, when I was expecting my son, that's when I went back. And that's when I went to the new doctor. And then roughly two and a half to three years later was when I, I got my, I got my AOK. -okay. So, so you, was it. You stayed yeah. with that doctor for the whole two and a half years after your son. Yes. Was born? Okay. Yes. And, that, and, and is that the doctor that's since passed away that you would. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, and it's, it's incredibly painful, not only for myself because of, of the gratitude that I have for him, for his daughter. Um, but also because there were so many people. I actually had a follower who messaged me saying the day he passed away, he had a heart attack, you know, at the office um, and they couldn't revive him. Um, she said, like, I was actually supposed to go in for my first appointment that day. And it was because you told me about him. Um, but I guess he wasn't meant to be the messenger, you know, for my healing. And that was incredibly heartbreaking. Um, with him, I... I kept to the regimen of supplements. I kept to, you know, doing infrared saunas when I could, you know, Epsom salt baths um, and different dietary uh, recommendations. Um, but I remember, and I would fly in every few months um, to see what was going on, how the infections were doing, and all that jazz. And I remember uh, the last appointment that I had with him. Um, I flew in by myself because thankfully my kids were big enough to stay home and they were at uh, daycare. And I was doing the muscle testing. I was just laying there. I was like chilling because Dr. W and I were homies at that point. 
And he's like, so what have you been doing? And I said, you know, I've been following the regimens, I've been taking everything every day. I've been, you know, avoiding the foods that you told me. He's like, no, what have you been doing? I'm like, dude, I told you exactly what I'm doing. And that he was also um, an Orthodox Jew. He was somebody who grew up um, completely unaffiliated um, and, you know, found his way um, to Orthodox Judaism. And he just yelled at me like, what did you do? And something popped into my head. And I said, you know, I started lighting the Sabbath candles 10 minutes early. And I started welcoming in the Sabbath 10 minutes early as per my mother-in-law's recommendation. And he goes, there you go. I go, well, doc, like Dr. W, what are you talking about? He's like, well, your infections are gone. And I mean, like the, you know, what you're doing makes sense, like with all the regimens and everything, but it doesn't make sense that it would go away this quickly. And I was just like, don't say that to me, man. No, just don't say that. Cause like, I'm not one of those people that'll, that'll buy into that. But I do remember, and I know this is, this is a practical podcast. This is a practical podcast of practical solutions. But I do remember that, that first Sabbath that I, that I took upon myself to like 10 minutes early. And my daughter was probably two years old. And um, we referred to God as uh, Hashem in this house. and. I did a like uh, a thing. I'm like, I told my daughter, I'm like, hey, like, do you wanna you wanna pray for your ima? She calls me ima because do you wanna pray for ima to feel better? So in her little squeaky two year old voice, she goes, please Hashem, make ima feel better, amen. And I just started crying, and I was like, if God does not listen to that, then like I don't know what. And it was very odd because that Sabbath was the first Sabbath that I started feeling a fog being lifted a bit. I still obviously was doing exactly what um, was recommended to me. I wasn't just throwing all of my, you know, responsibility into faith. That's not what Judaism recommends. You know, you, you believe and you do what's necessary. And I was, and I mean, I do think that my, that Dr. W is being humble um, but I also do believe that God had a, had a pretty large piece in that. Um, and he sends, you know, to every doctor or healer, like the ability to heal as a messenger. Um, but I think those in conjunction really helped me get, you know, to where I am, you know, health wise today. And, I mean, like I said, finding the right practitioner is crucial. Finding the right treatment method that works for you is crucial. And I mean, for my own sanity as well, you know, faith, you know, held a huge, huge, like played a huge part in that. So let's talk a little bit about that, right? Because, you know, we, um, you call this a practical podcast and, and we certainly take um, pride in being a practical podcast. Uh, and we want to give everyone tips on uh, on what practical steps they, they can take. But so why do you think it's not a practical step to um, to have a relationship with uh, with God and uh, and uh, and asking God to direct your healing path? Why is why do you think that's not a practical step? When I said practical, I kind of defined it as a man made active like a verb, so like, like, a, like a physical, active, manual thing that you yourself are doing, whether Tangible. it's, yes, there we go. Nicolette is here. We didn't lose her at sea. She's here. <laughs> she is, she is, she is here and breaking up just a little bit, uh, but certainly helping us to talk through this. So, but, but I do want to challenge you on this a little bit, uh, Barry. Because you know, one of the things we do on this podcast is we look for patterns, right? right. Uh, we look for patterns for, of failure. We look for patterns of success. So one of the things that really jumped out at me from the standpoint of a pattern of failure is that when you treated with one of your earlier doctors, your doctor didn't take you through a process of prehabilitation, meaning the doctor didn't get you and your body and your spirit and, and, and your emotions ready for this battle. And then just sort of, you know, rushed you with antibiotics and rushed you with all kinds of a field protocol. And it, and it really didn't work for you. Right. I mean, it was just, it, yeah. it, it, you just weren't prepared for that. Right. So, so one of the things we've observed repeatedly is that the doctors uh, and the, and the healthcare professionals that are treating people in this community 
if they understand prehabilitation and get you ready first and then go through the process of assisting or killing, uh, you know, assisting the immune system and then killing, that you have a greater likelihood of succeeding. And you're an example of a doctor who failed to understand that, right? So that's that's right. a that's a part of the model of failure that you're that you're demonstrating. But now we also see people who are succeeding, you know, when when they're on their treatment journey. And what we what we find is that people who believe they can heal, that they believe in their capacity to as 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 adaptive humans to take the steps that are necessary to heal then they are substantially more likely in fact probably you will not be able to heal if you don't believe in you and what we also see is the people who have the shortest path to believing in themselves and believing in their ability to heal and believing that they're the experts in them not the doctors are the people who have a relationship with God. So talk to us about how your relationship with God and the traditional community that you grew up in and the, and the traditional community that you continue to worship in was a helpful piece for you to have the belief that you could heal and why that was vital for you to get into remission. Well, in the beginning, I felt like I had this aha moment when the doctor told me I had a resistance to folic acid. He said that I had a genetic mutation called MTHFR. And I was like, mother effer, like that's hilarious. Um, so I told my <laughs> husband that I had the mother effer gene. Um, but then I was like, oh my God, literally like, look, now I know why I had to get Lyme disease because then maybe I would have had trouble, you know, conceiving and, and holding a pregnancy, which is what, you know, my doctor told me. Um, and I was just like, now I see it. And then I was like, okay, I learned my lesson now. And that was, you know, five and a half years before I was in the clear. So, you know, that wears off after a little bit. And uh, yeah. So I'm like, okay, that that's not exciting for me anymore. Like I thought I learned my lesson and like now, you know, what the heck, but I, I did have this mentality at that point. Um, so deeply ingrained in myself that I didn't even realize it, um, that I deserved all of the terrible things that happened in my life. And I think that also held me back from believing in healing and then going to Dr. W, who had such a positive attitude and was like, you know, with Hashem's help, with God's help, you know, hopefully I'm the right messenger, you know, for your healing. And also like pointed out, he's like, what is with your emotional situation right here? Like, there's a lot going on that you need to work on, my dear. Um, and that was also at like, at a point where um, I wasn't taking medication for my anxiety, which, you know, before my last appointment, I was, and he was like, I, I'm, I'm feeling that you're doing better. And this is a person who like, I thought would judge me for taking something not natural. And he's like, if it works, it works, sweetheart, you know, and just, and just kept going. And there was this, he also had me doing like tapping and like affirmations on different meridians being like, you know, I have the capacity to heal and with, with God's help, I will be able to. And kind of took like my need for control and my need to be, you know, have my hand in everything, because if I don't, then that means that, that I'm not in control. You know, he kind of took that piece away from me, knowing that like my healing is not up to me and my illness is not up to me either. So it's, it's not my fault. You know, what's happening to me sucks, but it's not my fault. And there are, you know ways to help and there is a way to heal and like I believe that I will heal was something that I didn't believe and he you know made me do those affirmations and and tap on different you know meridians and things usually just on my collarbone like or like my clavicle just like I believe that I can heal and with God's help I will you know like all these different affirmations which you know, then went into my subconscious of like, you know, I can get better and my life can get better than this. And I don't deserve to be sick and I don't deserve to have painful things happen to me. And my husband doesn't deserve a sick wife. 
And my kids do not deserve an absent mother or a weak mother, you know? And I think that also is what helps me open up to the possibility of healing and then incorporating my children into that being like, well, if it's still hard for me to believe that like I deserve it for myself, like my kids for sure deserve it. And that's why I kept them being like, oh, you want to pray for Iman? See, like pray that she gets better and, and whatever. And then the best part about that is that after she did that, she goes, please Hashem, help Abba make lots of monies. And I was like, obviously, you know what each of us value, like great, like you're a smart kid. Um, <laughs> and she's still, she's, she's, she's the best. Now she prays for herself to be healthy and strong and and it's just, it, it's beautiful to see. And I think that he, that, that Dr. W also took me into that shift of like, I don't deserve this happening to me. I deserve better. My family deserves better. And I'm not doing this to myself. I'm not bringing this upon myself because I deserve it. So now that you're bringing that up to me, like now that I'm thinking about it, which I haven't before. So I, I, I thank you for that. You know, seeing like being given that permission to let go and let God or let, or just, you know, whether someone, if someone's not a believer, like let the universe, you know, do its thing for you because you don't, you don't deserve a bad life. You don't deserve hell. Like you deserve to be a happy person with living pain-free and, and getting the best that life has to offer. I think that definitely helped. So let's talk about the difference between the way you were treated or the way you were working with Dr. W versus the way you were working with the other doctors, right? So you, you had three doctors in your journey and the first doctor was, hey, you have Lyme, be on your way, right? And, you know, yes. you have a prescription and that's it. And there was no communication. There was no treating the whole person. There was be on your way. This is an infection. Take these uh, antibiotics. You're going to be fine, right? Second doctor, again, just focuses on the physical barrier and gives you a very aggressive treatment without preparing you for it and and then essentially you know sends you on your way and by the way took all your wedding money in during the course of that process right yeah dr w number three is a very different doctor right because he understands that you have to be spiritually healthy and he understands you have to be emotionally healthy and he understands that the only way that you can become physically healthy is if you are spiritually healthy and you believe that you're emotionally healthy, that you believe that you have the capacity to heal and that your mind is then open to healing and that you are also a wife and a mother and that your healing has to take place in the context of, you know, your family in your community. Now, wasn't that, you know, a, a very radically different way of uh, interacting with the guy you were calling your homie, but really just somebody who was a good doctor who was treating the entire person, uh, the mom, the wife, uh, you know, the teacher, the, the person who's, who's worshiping in a traditional Orthodox community, and somebody who has to be given the permission to take the steps she needs to take in order to be emotionally healthy, whether that be with medication, whether that be with, you know, whatever treatment you need for your HPA axis, and then finally get you to a place where you can, you can overcome this challenge. You know, I have never thought about this experience in the way that you are so eloquently and accurately explaining it. Like, I never thought about this process and the drastic differences I just knew that I, though initially I did not agree or believe in Dr. W's methods, I'm still a little bit skeptical. Um, I'm like, what is muscle testing? Is that even really a thing? You know, <laughs> and like my husband's like, Mac, chiropractors, they're quacks, you know, like, but I'm like, this is the person that I've chosen to be, you know, no hate to anyone in any of these professions, by the way, like. I, I have seen a chiropractor since, okay? Just, just so you know, um, and everyone has different beliefs, but I, I, I put my faith in Dr. W as the messenger for my healing and, and the manner in which he, you know, interacted with his patients and the way, you know, the office handled patients. I, Never, never had to wait more than five minutes to get in. It was always with a smile. It was always with jokes. 
And it was always with like a, you know, how are you really doing? And how are you feeling? You know, while, while we were testing and moving things and let's see if your arm just completely flops or if it moves down, you know, there was, there was a sense of, you know, I can really trust this person with my health, with my care, um, which was really just something that I've never had with a, with a practitioner before. And I, I think that that was essential, you know, in something that I really, in, in an illness that was so complex, you know, to me and, and something that I just really didn't understand. And I still don't understand to the full extent, you know, I, I'm learning things from you guys, just, just being on this podcast and I'm, I'm learning more information and, and you are inspiring me to get more involved within my community to educate. I'm, I'm my, my cognition wheels were turning when you were talking about the, the camps and things like that you know, and I feel like I've tried to put the lime, you know, past me, but, you know, every, every week or so, or every few days, I get a message in my message requests on Instagram asking me about, you know, a loved one of mine was just diagnosed. Do you have any, you know, inspiration for me or any doctors to recommend or any treatments to recommend? And, you know, the last time I was in Muncie, someone came up to me in a bagel shop and said, you know, years ago, I messaged you because my husband got Lyme and I didn't know what to do. And you were so incredibly supportive. So I hugged a random woman in a bagel store. Um, but being on this podcast, you're reminding me that like, this is a huge part of, of my story. It doesn't define me. And, and I think I was trying to push it away because for so long, I let it define me. I was, I was that Orthodox chick who's open about her Lyme disease. But it is important um, to my story and it is important for me to be involved and share. And that's, you know, thanks to you guys. You guys are, you know, reminding me of how important it is to to share your experience and share your story. And, you know, I'll definitely be recommending this podcast because there's so many people suffering silently like I was and and they don't have to be. They they don't have to be. And and uh, and there, there certainly is hope for folks who are treated holistically as opposed to, you know, treating people through a particular prism. And one of the challenges that we see with many traditionally trained medical doctors and specialists is that they're always looking at you through the lens of their specialty rather than holistically, right? right. And you know, again, with no, you know, like you, I think, I think doctors are wonderful people. I think they 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 join the profession because they have a heart for helping people and they want to help people. But the problem is too many of them have too narrow a focus and they're too invested in just treating the physical person and not treating the whole person, right? And that's why so many times when people go to naturopathic doctors or they go to chiropractors or they go to other types of professionals who are trained in a more broad scope that they find themselves getting on a healing path that they couldn't get on, even though they were treating with some of the best and the brightest, um, you know, medical doctors in the world. And it's because, you know, it's because the, you know, the, the, the entire person wasn't being treated. And look, we, we've had on this podcast, people tell us that they remain symptomatic until they went through the emotional and the spiritual healing. In fact, Dorothy Leland, the vice president of Lyme disease.org shared with us early on that her daughter, who is very sick, did not ultimately become symptomatic, uh, free of her symptoms until she went through a neural retraining process. So her body held on to her symptoms, even though the Lyme disease had been killed until she went through that or that portion of her emotional healing. And it sounds to me that maybe you were served well physically by some of the earlier treatment, but you needed to go through the emotional and spiritual healing that you were able to get in, uh, you know, in treating with Dr. W that then allowed your symptoms to leave, even though perhaps you still weren't harboring uh, at least the Lyme bacteria itself. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, uh, and, you know, to, to continue, you know, what he's been doing, like for myself, you know, I've been continuing to address, you know, stuff that I pushed really, really deep down that I feel like has held me back physically and mentally. Um, 
And I believe that the more and more that I've been, you know, breaking through those things, whether it's through, you know, EMDR therapy, which I've done, I started doing energy healing, uh, you know, a year or so back, you know, all of this stuff has suddenly started to help me also remove some of that fog of my memory. My husband jokes now because I'll start being like, oh, I just remembered that this thing happened. He goes, why is every single memory of yours around food? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, dude, but just take the win because I remember something. <laughs> He's like, without fail, like I, I, I just, I'm waiting for that one time you tell me a memory that's just not directly connected to food. I'm like, we'll see, maybe one day. But, but it think, may be cultural, yeah. right? I mean, Jewish people love food and, you know, love it just food. could, could we, just we, be cultural. Yep. No, I remember during my Lyme journey, I like met with someone in a bagel shop and I remember staring at the second half of the bagel and people just started looking at me because I started yelling at it. Why can't I eat you? I was so <laughs> frustrated that like my body was like full and I'm like, that is not enough food. What is going on? And like, of course, bagel store in New York, like naturally. But, you know, continuing that process of, of healing, you know, and I threw my back out a, a few weeks ago and I was like, where's that coming from? Like, I've been pretty strong. This hasn't happened in years. And I'm like, I'm feeling like I put on too much. So like, yes, I, you know, addressed, you know, the Sarno aspect of it, but then I also went to PT and now I'm like, you know what, let me get stronger. Cause then maybe I'll be able to hold both of my 40 pound kids at the same time, who knows, but to continue to work on myself holistically is I guess, you know, carrying on, you know, what he imparted in like, he, you know, left to me and to so many of the people who were who were helped by him and i hope to be able to continue that and you know encourage other people to to look at themselves in a more holistic manner because you know the 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 infection you know a, as the as the second doctor even explained to me you know it can leave some people in wheelchairs and it can give some people headaches and I don't know the exact science of it, but I do have reason to believe that that a, that a facet of that can be the person's mental and emotional well-being can impact the amount that that it hits you. So, Barry, so, one of the problems that we have is that we don't really have an understanding of how our mind works. So we don't really understand emotions. We don't really understand ourselves as spiritual beings. And so we, you know, and, and, and there are there are some limits to the way we can articulate that part of us so we sort of segregate it right and just like i was critical of doctors who are looking through a limited prism of their of their specialty well it's the same thing with us when we're talking about ourselves right because we really aren't a spiritual being and an emotional being and a physical being it's all one it's all one right. thing right so just like you know doctors shouldn't be segregating a particular body part and trying to treat a particular body part because that's what they are an orthopedist or neurologist or you know or, or whatever type of specialty they have we likewise have to be careful to make sure that we don't get caught up in um, seeing ourselves as just a physical being and not ignoring uh, and not ignore the emotional part of us or the spiritual part of us because one of the themes that kept developing here during the course of this podcast and I and I and I hope our listeners will agree with me on this, is that, you know, the emotional Barry was somebody who was sort of left in a closet, right? And, you know, she was feeling uncomfortable about treating uh, herself emotionally. She felt uncomfortable that maybe Dr. W, who was, you know, also somebody who was fellowshipping in the Orthodox community, uh, you know, might judge you because you're, you're, you're using, you know, a, a certain type of treatment or he was, you know, he was, a, you know, he was a holistic doctor and, you know, and, and what you, what you kept doing is sort of like either putting the emotional piece aside or, or feeling uncomfortable about treating the emotional piece. And as it turns out, that if you're 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 in fight or flight, if you are in the sympathetic nervous state, if your HPA axis is pushing all kinds of adrenaline into your system at all times, guess what? You can't physically heal because your right. immune system is suppressed. And if your immune system is suppressed, it doesn't matter how much killing you do, because in the end, the immune system ultimately has to win this battle, and you have to be you have to be healthy, you know, immunolog immunologically if you're going to win this battle with all of these different microbes that your body was battling, right? And yeah. what, what what seemed to be happening with you, and and and, and give me your thoughts on this, was that. You know, Matt calls it whack-a-mole, where, you know, you use a, a particular type of treatment and you kill the particular bug in your body and then 
something else popped up, whether it be the herpes or the HPV or, you know, something was popping up, right? And, and why were the things popping up is because your, your, you know, your treatment was working, but your immune system couldn't manage another microbe. And then you would get rid of that. And then something else to take up because your immune system couldn't manage. But when you became spiritually healthy and you became emotionally healthy, you ultimately became physically healthy because your immune system was working in harmony with the whole of you. And you were able to manage these microbes and become healthy. A hundred percent. And I do think that Dr. Weidenbaum did give me the opportunity for that. And he kind of like showed me what I was missing. I was trying, I was focusing so hard on the, what do I, what, what pills do I take? You know, what do I avoid? And he's like, you also need to, you know, think about your mind and your soul and you're, you're really not doing that. So let's help with that as well. Um, which was surprising to me, but I, but like you said, is the core of how I got onto, you know, the path of healing. So let's talk about teams and tools, right? One of the things we've learned as a pattern in this podcast is not only do we have to treat the whole person, not only do we need to be supported holistically, but we also have to make sure that we're building the right team and using the right tools. And it seems like you had a lot of tools in here, but it really wasn't until you got the right team member on your team that you were able to heal. And, um, and so talk to me about how your gut was telling you that it was important for you to work with somebody from the same community that you were raised in, right? You you were raised in the Orthodox Jewish community and you found someone who is also uh, from the Orthodox Jewish community and how having a, a, a team member that could communicate with you in a way that you understood was vital to healing. See, now that you bring it up, like I honestly didn't need, like, I, I didn't think it would be a deal breaker if, if I had somebody treating me who was outside of my community, just like, you know, my therapists in the past, you know, have not been, you know, members of the community. It, it, it was something that kind of, I guess, at first happened because, like we said, we tried other places and the 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 most promising you know, it, it turns out that the first practi practitioner I had was also a member of the Orthodox community, but it was probably just because we were living in a high concentrated area of, of Orthodox Jews in Muncie. But then when it came to finding Dr. W, I mean, that happened completely out of social media and being already being friends with his daughter, who was, you know, sharing about different holistic tips and different, you know, recipes and, you know, making her own, you know, lotions and all these things. And I thought that was super cool. And that's how we connected. I, I didn't realize, you know, how actually working with Dr. W as a team, you know, on, you know, my healing would help me with, my spirituality it wasn't but clearly it was essential so i mean i do find you know divine providence in this because you know there's so many people you can meet on social media and like the fact that i connected with you know tahila his daughter who then said yeah my father you know deals with lime stuff call us and we'll see if we if we can do something remote or if you need to come in and that's where we started a three-way phone call. And then we got the blood work and then I flew in and, you know, it, it, I didn't know how much I needed it until I got it. If that makes sense. And, and I don't think I would have done it on my own because the, the ideas about myself and, and my worthiness of healing and my worthiness of goodness, um, were so negative and so deeply, you know, rooted in myself that like, I wouldn't have thought, you know, maybe I need someone to help me with that. It was, it was just them showing me how much I needed it. Like it was, it was that, you know, figurative smack in the face of being like, hi, like you need this. And I was like, oh, okay. And I would laugh. They're like telling me, I believe. And I would laugh. He's like, no, you need to keep doing this seriously until you actually believe it. So there would be times where we would have to do it like 10 times until I'd be like, okay, I might be open to this now. Not like this is ridiculous or like stop mid sentence because I was laughing or like he saw the like skepticism in my face. You know, it was, it was really 
I didn't value it because I didn't know I needed it. But now I understand how incredibly important it was. And I'm thankful that it was served to me on a, on a platter being like, hello, this is for you. Um, and I, I'm really, really grateful for that. Yeah, so Mary, I'm not arguing that we, we don't, you know, when we're building our team, we need to find somebody who is from our culture or who, who has the same ethnicity or necessarily is, is, is fellowshipping in the same community that we are. I'm arguing that we, we need to be able to find someone who can speak to us. Somebody who oh, 100%. can speak with us and give us the permission that we need. Now, in your case, it turns out that you did find somebody from the same spiritual community that you that you are from but I, i'm just arguing to you that this is a guy that gave you permission who spoke your language who who was able to get to your heart and to get you to even try things that you didn't believe in and as it turned out that whole combination of of, of events and the permission that he was giving to you is what allowed you to ultimately heal yeah i mean one of my mo's on on social media and my podcast is empathy and validation because even before you're willing or open to making a change, you have to be able to understand yourself like, wow, this is really hard, you know, and sometimes you can't give that to yourself and you need someone else to give that to you. And particularly in such a vulnerable situation where you're like, I'm so sick and I don't understand this and I don't know what's going on and I need help for someone to then be like, okay, here you go, go take this, go home. I mean, that does sound like a recipe for failure, like the way you you conveyed that to me. See, these are all things I, I didn't think about. This is almost like a therapy session right now, Rich. You're giving me a therapy session here. Right, Send me the bill. Um, we're, always, we're, we're, we're always blessed to help people see, uh, you know, the finger of God in their in in their lives and you know and 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 as a godly person and as a believer uh there is no doubt in my mind that that was an essential part of what allowed you to get to the powerful place that you are which is and, and there's another piece of this barrier so let's talk about let's talk about the beauty of Lyme disease right because you know look we 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 we've been big fans of yours for a long time right we we, we found we found some of the some of the um you know the articles uh you know one article in particular that you know, you very uh, powerfully participated in. Uh, we we are big fans of your podcast. So you you went from you went from being a person who was serving people in the special needs community uh, and, and and in a very small community of people that you were you were blessing through through your through your um, your work as a teacher to then becoming a, a public figure and to begin to serve the larger community through through podcasting and through and, and through uh, you know some uh, journalistic endeavors. So talk about how uh, you know your gifts, your God-given gifts, went from sort of being um, you know a uh, a place where you were serving a, a micro community to now serving the world generally. So it actually kind of started through um, my Instagram. Actually, I have a very active Instagram following, um, and you know over there I was just kind of I, I started you know going to different public schools across the Vegas Valley and. Uh, you know, teaching the Jewish students about different holidays, you know, we'd make menorahs and, you know, all that jazz and I'd break donuts. And, you know, slowly I was like, well, maybe I can share a little bit about my modest fashion endeavors. And then that kind of led into, you know, me just being like, wow, this is almost impossible to do with a kid. So I started sharing, you know, I can't, I can't like maintain this level of perfection anymore. And from there, it, it was just like, oh, like, so there's, you know, social media at that point, you know, Instagram at that point, you know, six years ago was missing, you know, a, a, a tiny component called reality. Um, and that's kind of where I started, you know, opening up, you know, parts of my, of myself, you know, I was using first my, my, my performing skills. I was using that, that, um, you know, like I said, when I was a young kid, I was using my, my performing skills to you know entertain people and bring them joy and then into you know my teaching and special ed i was using my you know ability to do impressions and sing and all of that to to make learning more accessible to individuals who needed to be taught in different ways and then it kind of went into using my creativity 
um, and using my voice, not in the form of song, but more in the form of, you know, expression. I, I, you know, speak, uh, across the country, you know, public speaking is not one of my fears in the slightest and using, you know, my, you know, openness and, and ability to, to address a crowd, not to, not to, you know, teach math skills or the times tables, but to share a part of my story and provide people with, with permission to recognize their struggle and, and, and see where their emotional distress is coming from and to get the help that they needed. And I think through my Lyme journey and my Lyme journey, I think really brought me to more of the heightened awareness of, you know, the trauma that I, that I've been holding, you know, so deep down that, you know, in recent years I have been unearthing, which is incredibly painful, but to be able to fully understand, you know, not fully, but, you know, to, to understand to a much greater degree that struggle can be invisible. And even more than that, you can look like you're doing great and you can look, you know, so skinny and so thin and so happy. Your body could look like a Kardashian and you could be miserable. And we need to open up and connect and find our team and find our people in order to thrive, in order to heal, like you said, in order to just move forward and evolve and, and take your own negative views about yourself out of the equation and realize that you're not alone. And my MO has kind of just been like, you're not the only one, you know, like I always say, you know, you're not special. And I don't mean that in like a negative way. It's like your struggle is uniquely yours, but you're not the only one uniquely struggling. And knowing that and finding a community of people who can validate and empathize that struggle is so important. And, and to have the honor of facilitating that, you know, I feel like all of our, our struggles um, don't define us, but are pieces of who we are and, and are pieces of our story. And if we don't use those pieces to help, then like, what was it all for? And that's that, why I started sharing. That was unbelievably beautiful, unbelievably beautifully said. And I, I will not ruin this podcast by <laughs> asking you another question about that, because that was absolutely one of the most beautiful things anyone's ever said on this podcast. So let's let's get to the last question. <laughs> the last question we ask everybody on this podcast is um, if God forbid, and I'm going to use your husband, who's been such a wonderful part of this, you know, this journey. I mean, what a beautiful man he is uh, to, you know, to give up literally everything The you know, the money that you were, you were gifted during your wedding, which would have, would have been the foundation for you buying a house so that you were to get out of the basement. He was giving that up. I mean, just, just, uh, uh, you know, doing everything he could to, you know, to support you. Let's say God forbid right after this podcast, uh, he came walking through me and he had a tick bite again. What would you recommend that he do so he wouldn't have to go on a, on a difficult uh, and suffering journey with Lyme disease? Well, first off, um, he's walked through trade shows over the past three free years because we live in Vegas. He picked up one of those tick removers and put it on our, our car keys. So I'd for sure grab that, send that, put that in a bag, send it to a lab to get tested pray my guts out and use, well, I mean, he thankfully is someone who truly believes in his own body to heal. So like he can get sick and like have the sniffles and I'll be like, I can't move. But I would know that it's not the end all be all and that I have resources and there are organizations that I can reach out to. And that it's going to suck if it turns out that, you know, he does really get sick. Um, but knowing from my own experience that it is going to be okay. Um, he's a lot stronger than I am. So no, I, he's not, he, he's absolutely not. Uh, there, there is no one stronger than you, but we'll, we, we, we can debate that offline. Okay. He, certainly, he certainly may be, he may be blessed with, uh, you know, with an immune system that may be a little bit stronger than yours, but he is no one stronger than you. I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to take that with me. I, I really, really like that, Rich. Thank you.
Right. So I'm glad you're going to receive that. So I, again, and, and you've been so wonderful with your time and so wonderful with this beautiful story that you've shared with us and you've given us so much, so much insight. So I'm, I'm going to let you go and, and, and I'm going to, uh, again, thank you for taking time away from your, your family to share this powerful story and your powerful observations. And I want to thank your husband and your children for sharing you with us and the community at Tech Bootcamp. Thank you. Thank you for listening to your Take Boot Camp with our guest, Barry Mitzman. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Barry, please visit our Instagram page at Barry Anna. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Take Boot Camp podcast, please share it with your friends on social media. Third, Take Boot Camp is created at Take by Blueprint. It has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at takebootcamp.com forward slash bite to view the blueprint. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on the podcast platform of your choice. And finally, if you'd like to search our podcast library of almost 350 episodes, subscribe to our email list, or share feedback, please visit our website at tickbootcamp.com. Thank you, as always, for participating and listening.